Hello Church, my name is Zare. Thank you for joining us online or in person as we gather together as one global church family. I'm thrilled that we have the opportunity to worship together. So however you're joining us, we'd like to welcome you to our worship gathering and look forward to sharing with you some of the ways in which you can get involved with us over the coming weeks. Church, we need you. Are you interested in investing into the lives of kids? TPC Kids is looking for volunteers to share the love of Christ with kids during their Sunday morning program. Join our TPC Kids team today and use the gifts and talents God has given you to impact the next generation. If at any point you feel that God is prompting you to say yes to impacting the next generation, you can start the next step by registering on the church website, thepeopleschurch.ca. This week, TPC Kids will be taking part in Make Waves. Please join us in prayer for the kids who will be attending and that they will have a safe and fun experience as they come together to learn more about Jesus. We pray that our kids will have the opportunity to grow their faith and learn how they can create a ripple effect in sharing God's love with those around them. Also, pray for the leaders, for wisdom in what they say, patience during long days, and for rest each night so that they can enter each day with the energy and excitement to share Christ. This morning, we have the privilege of hearing God's word from our minister at large, Charles Price. We are thrilled to welcome Charles back to our stage today. Church, it's time to worship together and hear God's word as we are inspired and challenged for God's global mission. Open doors and open arms, where scripture forges faith, community builds family, and Christ in us makes us one. This is where I, I feel like I'm continuing to grow. I love the community here. I actually really like serving here as well. Honestly, my life has been transformed by God under the teaching and the community of the people here. We found peoples and it felt like home when, when we came here. It's very nice to be welcomed in uh, in such a warm way. We are all on mission and to see everyone living missionally wherever they are in their workplaces, in their homes, in their neighborhoods has been life-changing. As we join together in God's global mission, we see the joy that the gospel brings. Feel the love that we all seek when we come to Him. Together, we call the People's Church home. A home with a vision to be gospel-centered and globally engaged. Where we depend on the Spirit, Scripture, and a life of prayer. It's where generosity and partnerships are the catalyst to finding purpose and making a change. Where home is spoken in so many languages. A home where we join together across the globe in Jesus' name. So, no matter who you are, no matter your story, welcome home. Welcome, People's Church family. Morning, Church. This is John and Elaine Winter, serving uh, with Send International in Thailand. And we're glad to be bringing the call to worship to you this morning. We're going to read from Psalm 34, and Elaine will read that for you. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be on my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us, let us exalt his name together. Let's worship together this morning. Good morning, People's Church family. It is great to be here with you. If you're joining online, welcome to you. Is it warm enough for you out there? Right? I, I'm not gonna complain because I know what's coming in like a few months, so I'm just gonna ignore that for a quick second and be so grateful for this warmth that God is giving to us. And on that note, will you please stand and let us worship our great God together, our holy, holy God.
continue to worship our God.
can stand here on this holy ground made holy only by you. The Bible tells us when two or more are gathered in your name, there you are also. Lord God, when we worship you in our midst, on this ground we stand on. Father God, may we come to you wholeheartedly without inhibition and lay it at your feet our worship that we cannot express enough for all that you have done for us, for all that you have planned for us that we know not of yet. God, we worship you. We worship your holiness. And we thank you for being the God who provides, 
the God who is here, who is personal, who we know, who stands in our midst and walks with us along life's path. Father God, we thank you for these moments where we can gather together and worship you, to be a community in your name. Thank you, Lord, for all of this time, for all of these moments, and for blessing us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, it's been wonderful worshiping with you. Will you please be seated? I want us to hold on to the beauty of that worship. I'm going to invite you to continue to bow your heads. And the presence of God that you feel now, I'd invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you through the week that you have just experienced. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I want you to think about how and when you experience the presence of God throughout the week. Just do that in the quietness. Some of you may be saying, actually, I felt far away from God this week, or I didn't take the time to notice his presence with me. And so you've come here to worship with your brothers and sisters, or you've joined us online, taken that time to worship so that God can just remind you he is present. He has been present throughout your week. (laughs) He is active and he is able. So what I'm going to invite you to do is I'm going to invite you now to think of one word that describes your week. Now, some guidelines. You can't use the word good. You can't use the word bad. And you can't just go, "Eh," okay? Those are off limits. So think of a word that describes your week. Does everybody have their word? Okay. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to, in a minute, invite you to stand. And I'm going to invite you to ask one another, how was your week? And everybody has their answer already. You're just going to share that one word. If you are worshiping online with us, I'm going to invite you to put your word into the chat, and people are going to be able to respond and interact with that. Are we ready? Let's stand up together. Go and ask one another, how was your week? And give them your word. Online, just enter it into the chat. Okay, so very good. Come on back to your places. I love it. No, 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 don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. Stay standing, stay standing. There's one more thing I'm gonna invite you to do. I love the fact that you're continuing this because This is a rehearsal for after the service. After the service, don't rush out to the parking lot. Your car's not going anywhere. (laughs) Continue this conversation. I just gave you a little moment, but I'm hoping you're saying, I want to find out more about that fantastic week, or I'd like to hear a little bit more about that challenging week. That's what we've come to do to worship God and to fellowship together, friends. But there's something more I'm gonna invite you to do while you remain standing. I also now want us to think about a situation that God has laid on our hearts, 
about what's happening in our world. Perhaps it's in our city, perhaps it's in our country, perhaps it's in another country of the world, another people group. But what is something that God has laid on your heart as you've read the news, as you've had conversations? Let's just bow our heads now. And invite the presence of God that we experience as we worship together to be known in that situation. Be assured, friends, he is present even in the most difficult, complex, challenging, traumatic situations. God is present. Let's acknowledge his presence in that situation that has been heavy on our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Thank you, thank you that we worship you, a living God, a God who is interested in what's happening in our lives, is interested and able about what's happening in our world. We acknowledge you. We lift you up with our praises. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to work in your powerful way in our lives and around the world. And we pray this because Jesus himself has invited us into your presence. In his name we pray, amen. Please be seated, friends. God is really active in answering prayer. And some of those situations, um, I just want to share about how God is answering prayer. In our church email, and if you don't receive our church email, we would love for everyone to receive that email. So if you're new here, or actually you've been here for a few weeks, but you're still not sure about whether this is your community, we would encourage you to get connected. So after service, you can just head out to the cafe there and we've got lots of people waiting for you or just reach out to somebody on your left or your right. Don't leave this place until you've been connected. For those of you who are worshiping online, reach out to the team that's interact <clears throat> excuse me, interacting on the chat. We send out an email every week and in that email last week, who gets the email? Put up your hands. Put up your hands. Oh, I see a lot of hands still down. Lots of opportunity to get the email, friends. In the email last week, we asked if anybody knew of a house that we could use in the city to welcome refugee claimants and to expand our ministry to welcoming refugee claimants. We sent that email out on Friday. No, Tuesday. Sorry, Tuesday. And then on Friday, we had the keys to a new house. I don't think we truly understand God at work in our midst. God at work in answering prayer. And it happened in a very simple way. We've got a picture up here of a young man who is a university missionary. His name is Luke. And Luke read the email and said, okay, I'm a summer student placement and I'm serving with a real estate company. He went to his supervisor and he said, my church needs a house. Do you have anything available? That simple, that bold, that obedient. And they found us a house because of this young man. <laughs> Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're involved in, God has an opportunity for you to say yes. God wants to answer prayer through you simply by just saying yes like Luke did. We also have happening this week, VBS, Vacation Bible School with our kids. It's happening here on site and it's happening at locations around the city. We've got teams working in neighborhoods that are also doing a vacation Bible school program. Again, just simply because people are saying, yes, 
I want to hang out with kids. I want to tell them about Jesus. And if you're saying, wow, I would have liked to help with Vacation Bible School, you haven't missed an opportunity. We need people to be working with our kids every Sunday, having that incredible opportunity to tell them about Jesus. But for now, please be in prayer about our Vacation Bible School. It's happening this week on site. It's happening throughout the summer all around the city. And a praise report. Our team who has been serving in Moldova and Ukraine are on the plane even as we gather now. They're on their way back home. Yes. And they are full of stories, of miracles, and how God is at work in that difficult place. I spoke with them yesterday on video, and they asked me to say to you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your prayers. God is answering prayers. And so when you see on the news all the bad news that's coming out of that area, please be assured, God is at work. He's answering prayers through people who are saying yes, just like us. Another incredible opportunity to serve is simply by giving, by saying yes to Lord, the Lord as an act of worship and thanksgiving out of that overflow that he has poured into every single one of our lives. So please, as you give this week, make sure that you bathe it in prayer. Make sure it's an act of worship, however you decide to give. You can go onto our website and just press the give button. You can text people's give, it's all one word, 77977. They're both really safe ways to give. And if you've brought it with you today, on your way out, you can just drop your offering in one of the boxes. But however you are giving, friends, please make sure it's an act of worship. Make sure you've prayed about how God is going to use that gift to bless others and bring honor and glory to his name. Because that is why we give. To give back to God that which he has given so graciously to us. So friends, we are now going to listen to the word. Charles Price was with us last week, and he is here again this week. And I think, yeah, let's welcome Charles as he comes. Many, many of you are very familiar with Charles, and it brings joy to your hearts to know that we're going to experience his teaching today. But for those of you who don't know, perhaps those of you online, Charles was our teaching pastor and lead pastor here at the People's Church for 15 years and now continues to serve in a beautiful teaching ministry and in a writing ministry that we're going to hear more about after the teaching. So let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, prepare our hearts. By your Holy Spirit, lead us into truth as we listen to your word. Please, Lord, anoint Charles as he shares his heart with us. And we pray that we will be transformed in your presence as we take in your truth. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Amen. Thank you, Sandra, very much. One of the great things about coming back to speak every once in a while is there's always new people here that I've not met before, and uh, good to see you as well as some of the oldies and the golden oldies. Uh, good to see you as well. I'm going to read to you in a moment from Ephesians chapter 1, from verse 15 onwards. Before I do that, let me briefly remind you of what I talked about last Sunday. And uh, if you were not here, uh, inform you, and if you were here, in case you've forgotten what I talked about. But from the first part of chapter 1 of Ephesians, we talked about the fact that we have an inheritance in Christ. That's a phrase that occurs there. We've been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. What is that inheritance? The key verse is back in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ that is, when Jesus Christ came to live in you, 
God gave you everything he has to give you because everything he has to give us is in Christ. There aren't any add-ons that we keep needing to go for. Strength is not an add-on. The scripture says the Lord is our strength. Guidance is not an add-on. You acknowledge him in all your ways. He will direct your paths, is his promise. Wisdom is not an add-on. Christ has been made unto us wisdom. Love is not an add-on, because the fruit of the Spirit is love, and so on. Everything God has to give us is in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about that last week, but now I want to talk tonight about a flip side of that, which is also in Ephesians chapter 1, which is that Christ has an inheritance in us. We have an inheritance in Christ. There are things we draw from him. He has inheritance in us. There are things he wants to draw from us. Let me read you from verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul writes there, for this reason... That this reason is what he's told them about what they have in Christ. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Let me pause there a moment. Your need is not to receive more things, but to know him better because everything you have is in Christ. So that's his prayer for them, that you know him better. But then in verse 18, and this is what we're going to look at this morning, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So if last week we talked about our inheritance in Christ, what is it that he speaks of as being Christ's inheritance in us. And notice in his prayer in verse 18, he says about that, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Not the eyes of your mind, but the eyes of your heart. This is more than simply an intellectual grasp of something. This is experiential knowledge of something. Because the very center of who we are is our heart. I love that verse in Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the, are the issues of life. And this is where this understanding needs to land, says Paul, that in your heart you grasp he has an inheritance in you, as well as the fact that you have an inheritance in him. Now he prays in verse 18 for three things. And just to put in his context, I'll give you the three things. He prays firstly that you may know the hope to which he has called you. It's a big important thing. Secondly, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And thirdly, you might know his incomparably great power for us who believe. It's the second one we're going to look at this morning, that you may know that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. This is not an inheritance we receive from God. It's one that he receives in us. It's called his inheritance, not our inheritance. It is in the saints, not for the saints. Now, what does this mean? God spoke in the Old Testament of Israel as his inheritance. In fact, there are 
I, I counted 38 separate passages that speak in this way. For instance, in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 9, it says, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted inheritance. In Psalm 78 and verse 71, Israel, his inheritance. He speaks about that repeatedly in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. And therefore, to understand what he's meaning in the New Covenant, we must understand what he meant under the Old Covenant. And under the Old Covenant, being the Lord's inheritance had to do with two things. Had to do with possession. He possessed them. And had to do with purpose. He had a purpose and agenda through them. Let me show you this, and then we'll talk about it in relation to the Christian life. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, uh, regarding uh, inheritance as a possession, he says, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. In Psalm 74, he speaks of that being a purchased possession, Remember the people you purchased of old, says the psalmist, the tribe of your inheritance whom you redeemed, Mount Zion where you dwelt. So there he speaks of Israel being his possession that he has purchased in the New Testament. His inheritance in us also has to do with his possessing us Here in Ephesians 1, verse 13, having believed, you're marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. The same idea. Not only possession, but we are purchased as a possession. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own why not you were bought at a price when Christ died on the cross amongst the various things were involved in his death was that he bought us outright we are his possession now is what he says there and one more verse Revelation 5 verse 9 it says, they sang a new song. This is in the end of the age. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men and women for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. To be his possession, therefore, is to be owned by him and to be possessed by him. If you're a Christian this morning, listening to my voice, if you're a Christian, what that means is that you are owned by Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, I trust you'll become one very quickly and you'll understand this. And I'll show in a moment, it's a liberating thing. As you come under his ownership, that's why Jesus Christ is called Lord of those who belong to him. Let me read you from Romans 14 and verse 9. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. The Christian life is about recognizing the Lordship of Christ in every area of our lives. I didn't understand that when I first became a Christian. I thought there were several versions of the Christian life. There was kind of Christian basic And Christian basic was when you came to know Christ as your savior. And the benefits were, your sins were forgiven and you're going to heaven when you died. That was kind of Christian basic. 
And then I thought there was a, another version, a Christian elite, or Christian super elite, or super deluxe. <laughs> and that was when you didn't only have Christ as Savior, that's the basic version, but you have Christ as Lord. When you would bring your life under his authority, when you'd look to him to guide you and to lead you. The problem with that is, that if you're not careful, you might end up being a missionary. And I thought, well, that's all right for certain kinds of people. That's the super elite version. <laughs> Whereas I was on the basic version as I understood it. But then I came to understand that is not what the New Testament teaches us. It tells us that Jesus Christ is Savior 24 times. He's described that way. It tells us Jesus Christ is Lord over 600 times. And that he is Savior because he is Lord. He saves us because he comes to take over and occupy our lives and rule our lives. And we cannot compartmentalize Christ and say, well, this is who Jesus Christ is. I like the Savior bit. I'll have that. You're my personal Savior. That's not a phrase in the New Testament. Let me illustrate this. My wife isn't able to be with us here this morning, Hillary, but if she was, supposing I was to bring her up here and introduce you to you for those of you who don't know her. And I said to you, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet my cook. What do you think she'd say? <laughs> I'll tell you what she'd say. She'd say, I beg your pardon, what did you just say? Who did you say I was? I, I said you were my cook. She said, I'm not your cook, but you cook for me, don't you? I mean, I, I bought your cookbook for Christmas. <laughs> she'd say, I cook for you, but I'm not your cook. I'm your wife. See, when I got married, I didn't stand in front of a group of people and say, I take you to be my lawfully wedded cook. <laughs> I said, I take you to be my lawfully wedded wife to have and to hold for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, etc., 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 to death us to part. That's what I said. That's what I meant. And she became my wife. And do you know what I discovered? I got a cook in the bargain. <laughs> but she's not my cook. She's not my cook. She, we have a little garden behind the house. She looks after it beautifully. I got a gardener. <laughs> I got a whole amazing package of things, as you do when you receive Jesus Christ into your life. But he doesn't become your savior any more than my wife became my cook. That would be an insult. And some of you look very nervous. I can cook. I do a boiled egg beautifully. She says to me every time, you do do boiled eggs well. It's because I do them for six minutes, that's why. Now, I'm not much good at that kind of thing, but if you're both the same, one of you is unnecessary, as, as uh, Ruth Graham used to say, so we're quite different. <laughs> but the point is this. When you come to Jesus Christ, you're coming into a relationship with somebody who is Lord, who wonderfully saves us, he wonderfully cares for us, he wonderfully guides us, leads us, if we let him, if we connect rightly with him. But he comes to be Lord. Now, for some of us, this is intimidating. But actually, it can be liberating. I love what C.S. Lewis writes, that six months after he became a Christian, he said, God began to change his life around and seemed to adjust everything. And he says, and I read, he says, it was like having the builders in your house. 
which is okay if they put a bit of paint over here, repair some damage over there, maybe enlarge a window or two, and generally make the house a little better and nicer than it was. Instead, he says, it was as though they were knocking down walls, they were taking the staircase and putting it in another place, they were destroying the old light fittings and putting in new ones, and the house became like chaos. And Lewis says, I said to God, God, what are you doing with my life, my house? And God said, don't you know I am turning your little shack into a palace? Yes, he'll mess you around. The Lord Jesus brings with him into our lives tears as well as laughter. Hard times as well as good times. These are all molding and making and constructing a palace fit for habitation of the king. And so the first thing about Christ having inheritance in us is he has a possession. You are mine. I can do with you what I want to do with you because what I want to do with you is good. Be transformed. Scripture tells us by renewing of your mind then you discover that the will of God is good and perfect and pleasing. That's the first connotation of Christ having an inheritance in us. The second, if the first has to do with possession, the second has to do with purpose. Let me go back to the background of Israel again. You find there that God in Exodus 9 verse 16 spoke to Moses about the nation of Israel when he was to lead them out of Egypt. And he says, but I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Moses, I'm bringing you out of Egypt not to give you a comfortable land in Canaan in contrast to the oppressive land in Egypt. That'll be good, of course. I'm not giving you a fertile land rather than the desert land of Egypt. That's good. But it shall have a purpose for you. And my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That was the reason God gave Abraham a promise about a son. And from that son would come a nation. And that nation would bless the world. And they blessed the world, as Paul said in Galatians 3, through the one seed he promised, which is Christ. He says, not seeds, plural. It's through the single seed, Christ. That's my purpose. You're going to bless the world. That was his purpose for Israel. But in the New Testament, similarly, the purpose is this. He calls his people his body. A little later on in chapter 1 and verse 22, he says, and this just follows on what I read to you just now, Ephesians 1, 22, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This idea of the church being the body of Christ is not a metaphor merely. It's not just an illustration. There's an element of reality in this. In that our bodies become the place where the spirit of Jesus Christ comes to live and we clothe his activity in the world. You see, spirits need bodies to work through, don't they? If somebody said to me yesterday, I can't be at People's Church on Sunday morning, but I'll be there in spirit, I wouldn't arrange to keep a seat for them. Because you don't need a seat if you don't have a body. (laughs) I mean, I know a number of people who are here in spirit this morning. You who, wherever they are. They don't know I'm saying that. If someone's here in spirit, I wouldn't ask them to sing. (laughs) I wouldn't ask them to volunteer for anything. 
because the spirit needs a body. Jesus Christ descended to his father, sent his Holy Spirit and gave to him on the day of Pentecost a new body. And it's called the church in which the same Jesus Christ that lived in one single body now lives in this corporate body. The very first verse of Acts implies that. Let me read you Acts chapter one, verse one. Luke, who wrote this, says, in my former book, Theophilus, which is the gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. That was the beginning of what he began to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now he says, that gospel of Luke is a record of all that Jesus began to do and teach. The implication is, this second volume is a record of all that the same Lord Jesus Christ continued to do and teach, not now in one place, one location, one body, but now through a corporate body, which is going to spread around the world, and where the Lord Jesus in them is going to express himself and do his work through them. And so in every single individual person who comes into a relationship with Christ, they receive the Spirit and they're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, as Paul explains it. He has in them another pair of hands with which he can work, another set of feet to which he can walk, another set of eyes to look with and ears to hear with and a heart to love with. Another set of possessions to help himself too. Because he now indwells them and they are his body. You see, my body, this, this hand is part of my body, not because I like it and fancy it. And think, oh, that's a beautiful fingerprint there. Oh, look at those lovely fingers. This is part of my body for one reason alone. My life is in it. We're part of his body because his life is in us. And we become his body. And the book of Acts is the illustration, as Paul said four times in the book of Acts, this is all that God did through us. God did, when he gave his missionary reports, God did through us. We're the means, but it was God doing it through us. His life in us was working through us. Let me give you one example. In Acts chapter 8, you find that Philip was in Samaria where he was seeing a, a, a real work of God and Hundreds and thousands were coming to Christ. The first big movement of the Spirit outside of Pentecost. And Philip was the primary preacher in that instance. And Philip was in the middle of his preaching in this great revival when it says in verse 26, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. I imagine Philip said, I beg your pardon? A desert road? I'm the preacher here. I'm preaching to all these people. People are coming to Christ. There's amazing work going on. There's a road. I mean, am I supposed to speak to cactus? What's, what's going on? No, he didn't say that. Because he knew that the Lord Jesus is head of the body. He said, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. I put a circle around go and a circle around so. A few words later go so so what so he set off and you know the story he met an Ethiopian eunuch riding a chariot through the desert he ran up towards his chariot the man was sitting there reading from Isaiah the scroll of the prophet Isaiah reading the section that talks about he was led as a lamb before the uh, uh, to the slaughter etc a description of prophetic description of Christ's crucifixion and Philip ran up to the man and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So Philip said, well, I'll explain it to you. He did. He became a believer. He baptized him. He went on to Ethiopia. And there's record of a church in Ethiopia from the earliest days, no doubt, from this man who Philip met on the desert road of all places. There are three elements in this story. There's, well, there's, Ethiop there's sorry, the Ethiopian, who I'll call a seeking soul sitting in his chariot reading from Isaiah the prophet he'd probably been to Jerusalem as a Jewish proselyte now going home discouraged confused doesn't understand it a seeking soul Philip I'll call a committed Christian and by that I don't mean he was committed to evangelism because he would have stayed in Samaria if he was he was committed to God 
And when you're committed to God, you're always flexible because he is flexible. And God said, go, so he went. And bringing the two together is who I'll call a guiding God. God who saw the Ethiopian in the desert, Philip in Samaria, and he demanded to talk to that man. Here's one in Samaria. Philip, go, all right? So off he went, bumped into him. So there's a seeking soul, a committed Christian, a guiding God bringing them all together. Now that's in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 9, there's another seeking soul called Saul of Tarsus, religious to his back teeth, but searching for God. Struck by God and blinded on the Damascus road, went to a house, unconverted, confused. And God said, I need a, I need a man, a committed Christian. There's Ananias. Ananias led by the guiding God to the committed Christian, them to Christ. Acts chapter 10, and there's another seeking soul. His name's Cornelius, a Gentile, a good man, built a synagogue for the Jews. Good works, but they don't save him. But God said, your good works become a sweet smelling savor. I love your good works, show your heart. I need a Christian to talk to you. Peter, down in Joppa, go and talk to that man. The committed Christian, taken to the seeking soul by the guiding God. And this principle, I think, is a wonderful one because, you see, the guiding God is still at work. They're still seeking souls all over the place. And they're committed Christians sitting here this morning. And his inheritance in you, you say, Lord Jesus, I'm available to you. It doesn't always involve leading people to Christ. It might involve making the right link so that the home can be opened for these people coming into the country seeking refuge that we just heard about. Luke was a committed Christian available to God. And God led him. And this house is opening in the next few days. It doesn't matter what it is. It's the availability. Lord, I'm available to you. What does he want me to do? That's his inheritance in us. remember coming home one day, and I got home, and my wife said to me, you know that couple live at the end of our street? We didn't really know them, but we knew who they were. She said, I hear that the wife died last night. She had a heart attack, was taken to the hospital, but she died by the time they arrived. And I said, I'm so sorry. And I felt in my heart, I should go and speak to her husband and offer my condolences to him. I didn't know his name. I just knew where their house was. But I didn't go. There's always excuses. I was busy, whatever. I forgot. Some months later, I was sitting in a restaurant on a Saturday morning with one of my children. We were having breakfast together. And as we sat down at the table, on the next table was a man sitting on his own. I thought to myself, that's the man who lives at the end of our street. That's the man whose wife died. So I said to him, excuse me, I think I've seen you before. Don't you live such a street? He said, yes, I've seen you before too. You live at the other end. I said, yes. I said, I believe your wife died recently. He said, yes, she did. I said, I'm so sorry. How are you coping? He said, not well. He said, amongst other things, I come here to have a nice cooked breakfast on a Saturday morning because I don't know how to look after myself. I don't know how to cook or anything. So I said, at the end of our time there, I said, um, do you come every Saturday morning for breakfast? He said, yes, I've started to. I said, I'm free some Saturdays. Would you mind if I join you sometime? He said, I'd love you to. I said, what time do you come? He said, 8 o'clock. I said, if I'm free on a Saturday, I'll come and join you here and we have breakfast together. So I did. He knew nothing about me. I knew nothing about him. We got chatting. I discovered he was really interested in a, in a man called Nostradamus, who was a prophet in the 16th century, a French prophet, who made all kinds of predictions, some of which seemed to be quite remarkable. He told me all about this. He'd been long fascinated by this. He said, what's your interest? I said, well, I'm interested in the prophet as well. <laughs> I said, uh, I think my prophet is better than your prophet. <laughs> he said, who's your prophet? I said, Jesus Christ. He said, oh, <laughs> are you one of those? <laughs> said, well, I'm a Christian, but so after a few weeks, we made an agreement. Why don't you give me a good book on Nostradamus 
and I'll give you a good book on Jesus Christ. And we'll read a chapter each. And then next time we, we talk about that chapter. So I gave him a book called um, uh, Basic Christianity by John Stott. He gave me his book. And we would meet and we'd discuss and the content of the chapters and so on. And it was, it was all good, nice, easy. It was great fun, actually. We had some laughs together, talked about life. It all spun off. It all kinds of things about life. But after about, I don't know, 10 months or a year, I'd meet him maybe every three weeks, four weeks, depending on when I was available. And uh, I came in, he was already sitting there, and he said, I knew there was going to be a catch. I said, what's the catch? He said, I got to the chapter where it says you've got to do something. He said, you Christians always have a catch at the end of what you <laughs> tell us. We talked about that, and I said, are you willing to do that? He said, I don't think so. I said, fine. Only when you're ready. But he did become ready a few weeks later. He said, I'm ready to pray that prayer. And he did. And then we spent months talking about what it means to live the Christian life. And we started using the Bible now instead of these other books. And I came home one day and Harry said to me, I won't give you his real name because this is being broadcast. But I'll call him Barry. It wasn't his real name. I got home. And Hillary said, I've just heard from one of our neighbors that Barry had a heart attack and died last night, very similar to his wife. I thought, oh dear, I'm so sorry. I didn't know who I should go to to offer my condolences. I didn't know anything about his family. Three days later or so, I was sitting in the home one even, at home one evening, knock on my door, went and opened the door. Young man there, well, middle-aged man. He said, uh, my name's so-and-so, I'm the son of Barry so-and-so, I believe you used to have breakfast with my dad. I said, yes, I did. I'm so glad you've come to see me because I didn't know who to contact. I'm so sorry that he passed away. I said, I, I loved my times with him. He said, well, he loved his times with you. He talked about them all the time. He said, we're going to have a funeral for him. It's going to be a secular funeral. Uh, no prayers, no hymns, no readings, just people talking about their memories. Would you come and talk about your breakfast with him? I said, I'd love to, provided, can I ask a condition, that I have the last slot? He said, sure, you can have the last slot. So people told their stories, and there were lots of laughter and so on. And uh, he was a funny man. And then his son got up and said, now, my father made a friend in the last... Uh, a couple of years of his life, he used to meet for breakfast every morning, every week rather, when, he, when they were available. And uh, I've asked him to come and talk to you about his breakfast with my dad. So I talked about Nostradamus. They all laughed about that because they all knew about that. And I talked about Jesus Christ. They weren't getting a bit nervous now. <laughs> and I said that, uh, you know, we talked about, I said, my prophet's better than your prophet. <laughs> And then I talked about how he gave his life to Christ, invited Christ to come and forgive him and live within him. His coffin was to the left of where I speak and said, Bruce's body lies in this coffin, but Bruce doesn't lie in this coffin. People say, does a body have a soul? More important question is, does a soul have a body? Yes, a soul has a body for a short time, but the real person has eternal potential. I said, Bruce, He's not in that box. He's enjoying the presence of Jesus Christ. So I finished like that, trying to be gentle. And of course, there was no prayers, so I didn't pray anything. I went and sat down, and his son got up and said, well, that was different, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, when we were having some refreshments afterwards, Three or four people came to me and said, can I have breakfast with you one day? <laughs> now, the reason I tell you that is I almost missed that. I almost missed it. I said to Hillary, I'm sorry that his wife died. And I felt in my heart, go and speak to him. And I should have done. I didn't. God gave me a second chance. But you see, he has an inheritance in me. It's not I'm busy. Oh, I've got these things to do. Oh, I'm tired. No, he owns me if I'm a Christian. I'm his possession. I was bought with a price. Therefore, enjoy the riches of his inheritance in you. Enjoy them. 
but let him enjoy the riches of his inheritance in you, which is another pair of hands to work with, feet to walk with, heart to love with, lips to speak with. That's the Christian life. And if we do not allow him to enjoy his inheritance in us, we will not enjoy our inheritance in him. Because the riches of his presence in us is not just a, a backup for all our needs and wants and desires. The riches of his inheritance in us include meeting lots of needs, but him working in us and through us for his own glory and his own goodness. Let's thank him for that and let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ is not sitting in the heavens. We know he's on the right hand of the Father, but by his spirit, he is living in the hearts and lives of every true believer. Thank you for those in this building and those listening to my voice in whom the spirit of Jesus Christ lives. And we confess that we grieve the Holy Spirit so often. We quench the Holy Spirit so often. We resist the Holy Spirit. Your word tells us we're capable of all these things. But we want to be people who submit to the Spirit of God, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who live in submission to Christ as Lord, that our lives might become a vehicle for your goodness and your grace. And we will participate in the joy of that. Make that real for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to just stay with me for a moment, Charles. It's so good <laughs> that you are not just a teacher of the word, but you are a doer of the word. Thank you. And we are told not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. Another really important aspect of Charles' ministry is he writes as well. And for those of you who haven't read any of his writings, we just heard a very inspiring story of the difference a book can make in our own lives and in the lives of others. And Charles has brought with him some of his books. And for those of you who have had the opportunity to read them, you'll know that they are good and practical and are filled with powerful things. So Charles, I'm wondering if, there's a few out there, I'm wondering if you could tell us what your favorite is. Which one would you recommend? Or is that like saying, who's your favorite kid? My, I don't know. My, yeah, that's right. My favorite book isn't here because it's one written by Hilary, my wife. That's also there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> These two go together, Christ for real, alive in Christ. And they, they address the fundamental principles, what it means to be in relationship with Christ. Mm. What it means for Christ to be in us and us to be in him and many facets around that. So that's what those two are. And they're all going cheap today, by the way. They're $10 each. They're normally, they're 15 US, which is about 20 yeah. Canadian, but it's actually 10 here. And, and if you get three of them, you get three for 25. So that's a, that's a good deal. Any Scots people here will be out the door before the last prayer, because that's what they do. So there's about six titles out there, so, so okay. different and one things. one of them Hillary's, yes? One of them Hillary's. Two of them are study books. There's a Comes on Joshua and a Comes on Matthew's Gospel. Those are study nice. books, but, but they're valuable for some of you. Now, for some people who aren't readers, um, yeah. you also have an app available now. Could you tell us a bit We about do. that? Um, this is a group of guys in Australia put this together. It's a website with video, audio, and transcripts of all the messages that were taped here, recorded during those 15 years, and most of them distributed on Living Truth after that. Um, but then there's, a, there's an app, and that has all of that. There's several things on there, but it has a daily devotional that comes in every day, which is an extract from something we've edited and tried to make it compact and, and concise that, that hopefully will will encourage and feed people's souls and, and encourage them towards, towards uh, uh, a deeper relationship with God. So that's the app. If you, the site, the, behind me on the screen, you'll see charlespriceministry.org. That's the place to go. 
Um, you can download the app from that. It's available from many sources. There's also a Living True, uh, sorry, a Facebook uh, site as well. But if you go to charlespriceministry.org, that's where you'll, you'll access all the rest of it Perfect. as well. So and that's been available now for a couple of months. So, um, Perfect. So, yeah. So those who are watching online can access those resources. For you who are worshiping in person, go out and don't miss this opportunity to get the resources. Thank you, Charles. And friends, also out in that Connection Center are opportunities about how you can connect. We've all heard and been challenged to connect where we are in our own networks. But there's also opportunities to serve here. So if you want to find out more about that, again, go online to our website or head to our Connection Center. If you are new here, make sure that you uh, connect there. Now, I want you to recall the conversations you were having at the beginning of the service. Remember when I was trying to get you back and you were just all out of control and you just wanted to keep talking? This is your opportunity to do that. So we heard Charles' words. Don't miss any opportunity to have a God conversation, to be encouraged in the spirit. So we're going to encourage you to go outside into the beautiful weather or into the lobby to have those wonderful conversations. For people who are just wanting to spend some time praying about what they heard or perhaps what they're experiencing right now, stay in your seats. And you can either pray on your own, just spend a few quiet moments, or one of our prayer team will come to you. For those of you who are watching online, you can just request prayer, and someone from our online team will join you and pray together. So let's stand for our blessing, okay? Think about the people that you have worshipped with today, those standing on your left, on your right. For those of you online, think of the people in your neighborhood. And now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church, in us, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Amen. Go in peace, church. Thank you.